I think where people get tripped up too about the whole like, quote, healing journey. Like I went on that trip and was like, I have to fucking come back healed. Like this has to be the trip Mm -hmm. where I come back and I am fixed. And it's like, what the fuck does that even mean? You know, fixed for what capacity of your life? Like there are going to be so many different times where you feel like you've taken 10 steps back. There are going to be so many different experiences in your life where you're like, okay, now I have to heal again. And that can be exhausting. Hello, everybody. You are listening or watching Chatting with Candace. I'm your host, Candace Horback. We are going to start off by doing some shout outs today. So I wanted to say a big thank you to everyone that's bought me some cups of coffee recently. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Ray. And thank you, Ultra Magnus. I really appreciate it. If you want to support the podcast, you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash Candice. Uh, it all goes back into the podcast. And you can check out some of our affiliates and sponsors below. And... Let's do something we haven't done in a while, which is some Patreon shout outs. Let's pull up some members. You can also join the Patreon account where you get early access to episodes. You get to ask guests some questions. It's on chattingwithcandice.com and the coffee link is there as well. So we want to do a big shout out to Richard, Brandon, Nate, and Bill. Thank you for being a Patreon. I sincerely appreciate the support. Could not do this without any of you. If you haven't left a five-star review, I'm going to nudge you to do so right now. Um, You can do it more than once. You don't have to type anything. Just hit that five-star. It helps with the algorithm, and it seems to be working. So Without further ado, this week we have Gabrielle Stone joining the podcast. I don't want to give too much away because we jump right into it at the beginning of the podcast, but she went super viral on TikTok. When I say viral, I mean like 70 million views, and I was one of those viewers, and I didn't even realize it. It was just serendipity happening. But she has an incredible story and a lot of really great advice for everyone. So I really hope you enjoy the conversation, and please help me welcome Gabrielle Stone. So really funny story. I was um, like refreshing on some of your content this morning as I was getting ready for this podcast. And I didn't even realize that I was one of the like 70 million people that saw one of your TikToks, like one of your super viral TikToks, like when you immediately posted it, like way back. And I had no idea. And then it's kind of like come full circle. I was like, wait a second. I've seen this. Yeah. I love it. I love it. TikTok has been a really crazy marketing tool that I never expected. Like I was never planning on getting on another social media app and then COVID hit and I was like, well, I'm bored. Let's do it. And lo and behold, it's been like the biggest marketing tool for me. Yeah. Your story, because you did it to like one of those dances and it was when that whole like dun, 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 whatever was trending. (laughs) So you never knew what someone was going to type above it. And then I'm just like watching engrossed. I'm like, I have to find out what happens. There's no way. I love it. Yeah. Um, I feel like my life has been this weird combination of like a fucked up Netflix story. So it was kind of made for TikTok, the highlight reel <laughs> version of it. But at the at the core of it, it's become this like wild self-love healing journey, which is why I think once people dive into the book, it really resonates on a whole different level than they were expecting. Yeah. So the book is Eat, Pray, FML. And that is – so Eat, Pray, Love is one of my favorite – I just love Julia Roberts in general. She's one of my favorite actresses. Like She's like my comfort actress. That movie to me, I feel like every woman needs to watch it. I had my husband watch it recently and he's like, I "I get it. it." He's like, I get why people love it. I don't see why it's necessary to travel and do what she did. And I was like, I get it. Like I I mean, maybe that's something that women tend to relate more is – maybe going outside ourselves a little bit for that self-discovery where I feel like men tend to be a little bit more internal in that process. So that's probably why there's a little bit of that disconnect. But your story, it's it's so real. It's like it's the more reality based version of that of that book, which or and movie. And I guess my question is when you had this moment where you were love bombed and this set this first was it the first man you were with after the divorce? Yeah. So basically, I I was married for almost two years, found out he was cheating with a 19-year-old for six months, along with like a myriad of other extramarital affairs, filed for divorce, left. And then the man after that was like, 
love bomb me just like madly in love zero to 100. And I was like, oh my God, this is the person I'm supposed to be with. Of course, I had to go through all this horrible bullshit in my marriage and invited me on a month-long trip to Italy 48 hours before we were getting on the plane, told me he needed to go by himself, broke up with me. I was fucking devastated, like broke my heart like my ex-husband never could have done and was like, well, I can either stay at home heartbroken or I can go travel Europe for a month by myself. So I took my backpack and I did six countries and wrote the book about it on the trip. Mm -hmm. Well, it was where I was going to go was first, how how did you find that trust to be able to just go to your by yourself instead of wallowing, instead of laying in self pity and this place of victimhood? Like, how were you like, no, I'm going to turn this into something and I'm not going to kind of surrender to this. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to go continue to live and explore yeah. and be curious. I have to credit my mother to that for instilling that in me. You know, I lost my dad when I was six pretty traumatically. I walked in and found him dead on the floor from a heart attack. She was across the world filming a movie in New Zealand. She obviously like flew home the next day, but it takes like 24 hours to get home. So it was me and my nanny and she got home, which is like a 24 hour plane ride, did the, the celebration of life, got all his affairs in order and then took me and my nanny flew back to New Zealand and finished the film. And that was kind of my first experience of like, okay, so when trauma happens and when your life just fucking erupts, like you pick yourself up and you somehow get through it. Um, I then lost my high school sweetheart in a car accident when I was 18, which was very sudden. And it was again, kind of like that same fear of abandonment wound that was getting ripped open. But again, that same lesson of like, okay, how are we going to not push it down, like definitely like deal with the grief and work through it, but that eventually you're going to come to a road and there's going to be two different directions and you can choose to go right and stay in the victimhood and allow this tragedy to become like what defines you and what makes you. And like, that's what, you know, everything's fallen back on. Like, oh, well, it's because this happened to me is why I'm like this. Or you can choose to go left and be like, this is not going to define me. It's going to be a springboard to make me into a better human. And how can I grow and learn from this and make myself a better person from it? So it was really knowing that that was at the core of it. It was like, what was wallowing and being home heartbroken going to do for me and a little dash of like we were supposed to get on a plane in two days so like what was like you know the real choice like it's not like I was going to refund my ticket and Europe had been on my list for quite some time so I knew in that moment that whatever this trip was going to bring was going to be a huge healing journey for me so I knew it it just felt right I knew it was something that I had to do. So you mentioned that he had broken your heart worse than your ex-husband could have. Like, Why do you feel that I guess that heartbreak was so much more painful or more intense or that that possibility was greater with him than with someone that you were married to? Yeah, it's really interesting because a lot of my readers will message me and be like, why is it the guy after? Like, Mm -hmm. why is that the one that fucks you up so bad? And I'm like, girl, I know. I think for me specifically – so like I said, I had I had lost my dad and my high school sweetheart throughout my life. So I had developed this kind of like fear of abandonment and when I love someone, they leave, which manifested in me never wanting to be alone and always wanting to like have a man in my life or always living with a roommate. And through my healing journey, once I, you know, got to Europe and started really like digging in deep, I realized that I had loved my dad and he died. I had loved my high school sweetheart and he died. So I married my ex-husband because I wasn't fully in love with him and that felt safe. Mm. Subconsciously, obviously. I wasn't walking down the aisle being like, we're good. (laughs) It's all fine. I don't really love him. Like, of course, I loved him (laughs) as a human, but I wasn't in love with him. Mm -hmm. And I think that was part of my saving grace when the divorce happened because I wasn't dealing with this like epic heartbreak. I was dealing with betrayal and rage for someone who had been my best friend for five years and had promised to keep my body safe and spoken these vows to me that now was so clearly done. But no, the heartbreak, unfortunately, was what came after. But I was thankful that those were two separate ordeals. Like the the fallout from the divorce that I felt was very separate from the heartbreak that I ended up feeling before the Europe trip. So how do you keep your heart open 
So you go through heartbreak and you go through devastating loss, like real trauma. I think it's so important to to distinguish between trauma and just a hardship. They are different. They, and the human, like the human ecosystem is so resilient. We are made, even through trauma, we are made to really be able to process and move forward. Otherwise, we wouldn't have evolved to where we are. So I think we're in this place that gets really dicey when like every infringement is a trauma. And I think that that dishonors the actual trauma. Like you have gone through real trauma. Trauma is it's outside of the ordinary, right? Like you're not supposed to die young. You're not supposed to lose your lover, your first love young. You're not supposed to, as a child, like be the first one to discover your father. Like those are abnormal. That is real, real trauma. And I yeah. honor you for for, sh- for sharing that and going through that. Thank you. And I think that a lot of times we'll see something like a divorce and we're like, well, that's trauma. Well, that's unfortunately, that is, it's a hardship. It's a heartbreak. I'm not saying it's easy, but I personally wouldn't classify it as that. So I think like that distinguishing um, definition, I think is, is really important. Yeah. I think that there's definitely different levels of kinds of trauma, but you're right. I think in today's world, we're so quick to be like, oh, this is my trauma. These are my triggers. And it almost like, takes the importance of, you know, like, like you said, the real trauma is kind of away from those. Um, and I think it's really important to own those traumas, but not like we were saying earlier, be a victim to them. Like I remember very clearly getting into a fight with my mom when I was like in my angsty teen years and we were in the throes of yelling at each other. And I was like, well, I'm like this because dad died. And she stopped everything and looked at me and was like, Gabrielle, you can be sad, you can be angry, you can feel whatever you want to feel, but you will never use your father's death as an excuse as to why you're behaving a certain way ever. Um, And I think that so often when people don't resolve the trauma that they go through, they end up inflicting it on other people. And then those people end up in therapy for the trauma that they didn't fucking solve in the first place. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, it's very, very important. But I get the question, how did you keep your heart open a lot? Mm -hmm. Because I get that when you go through stuff, especially like a divorce or a heartbreak, your initial thing is to be like, all right, we're closing up shop. Mm -hmm. I'm putting a wall up. Fuck off. Everybody can just like leave me alone. We're done. And that would have been really easy for me to do after finding out about my ex-husband's affair and like all the things that were so interwoven with that situation. But if I would have done that, I would have never met the man after who in the book's name is Javier. I would never have fallen in love like that. I would never have had my heart broken, which I can assure you was the first big heartbreak of my life um, in that sense. And I wouldn't have gone on this trip. It wouldn't have completely changed me as a human and like healed me in so many different ways I didn't know possible. And I wouldn't have written this book about it that's completely changed my entire career and my life and given me such a gift to help other people who have gone through the heartbreaks and the traumas all over the world. So I always say, always keep your heart open. That doesn't mean to like walk into a situation and like put on a blindfold and ignore all the fucking red flags flying in your face, but always keep your heart open and take that risk because you're either going to end up heartbroken and learning a really incredible lesson and becoming a better version of yourself so that you can then attract the good, amazing stuff you want into your life or you're going to be wildly happy, either of which is time well spent and an experience worth having, in my opinion. Is ha- Javier was uh, the, I think that's the name of the actor in the love section, right? Of Eat, Pray, Love. Like that's his real name. Yeah, I think he's played by Javier Bardem. So what's so yeah. crazy is that I, 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 like, love get ner- I get nervous saying this, but I had never seen nor read Eat, Pray, Love. The day before I left on my Europe trip, which was obviously like the day after I found out like, hey, you're going alone and we're breaking up, I sat down to watch the movie, still had not read the book. And literally my jaw was on the floor because I was like, oh my God, this is my fucking life right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> wait, this is ridiculous. Um, and right before I had watched that that movie, I had had a conversation with my Javier and he was like, how are you feeling, Gabs? And I was like, like I'm about to go on a journey of eat, pray, fuck my life. Because obviously you know what eat, pray, love is. But this was so not what was happening. And I knew that that was not going to be my 
type of healing journey. Um, and so I sat down and watched, watched the movie and was like, holy shit, like this is really what's about to happen to me. It was so crazy. And there were odd similarities once I wrote the book in Europe that once I went back and eventually like a year later read the book, Eat, Pray, Love, was like, oh my God, there's weird so – it's vastly different, but there's weird similarities. Obviously, the the title is like a sarcastic tongue-in-cheek play on on the classic novel that everybody knows, but there were weird similarities that like even in like random name selections that I chose that I had like no clue existed in the original book. It was weird. I believe it so much in that. I think like attracts like, and I think that our frequencies can can create our realities. It's like oh, the totally. thoughts become things, which kind of goes back into like to keeping your heart open and not closing it off and not saying fuck all men and kind of like punishing that sex as a whole. Because I feel like with women who do that, when we like close up our hearts because we've been hurt and then we start to encounter more of like that archetype of men that we don't like. And we're like, mm-hmm. you know, the guy who's inconsiderate or the guy who's rude or the guy who's sh- bossy or sh- shovey or overpowering or whatever it is for you almost like get more of what you don't want because totally. you're so you're like so closed off to that. It's kind of like we it's extreme accountability and an extreme yeah. accountability for our reality and like what we are kind of manifesting into existence. So I think 100%. that's so, like so important to tell women and you know the following it's yes your heart's broken and that doesn't uh, like that doesn't give him permission to do bad behavior or anything but it's to not punish men forever and close your heart forever because then what are you getting? Like where is the trade off in that or like where is the payoff in that? You're not gonna have a happy fulfilled union or partnership with someone because you have just like put up that wall. Well and you're focused on it. You're walking around going like men are assholes, like you know, everybody has like cheated on me and like fuck all these people. But also like I really want a relationship. It's like you can't hate what you're trying to attract. So my background is like a blueprint example of this. And I always tell people on my podcast, I'm like, look, I know you're going to get triggered when you hear this, but like if you're attracting certain men into your life or certain whatever, like any pattern into your life, if there is mm-hmm. a pattern that you've attracted more than once, yes, there is something within you that is attracting that to kind of mirror it to you so you can wake up and heal that shit. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to take accountability for that. So for me, it was the fear of abandonment. And when I love someone, they die. Like that was my subconscious thing that was like carrying me throughout my life. And so I attracted my ex-husband who abandoned me in one of like the most heinous ways possible. And the universe was like, okay, Gabrielle, are we ready to go heal this? I was like, no, 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 I'm good. I'm going to go over here. Hey, Javier. Attracted (laughs) him into my life who quite literally – it's like almost laughable – quite literally abandoned me two days before we were getting on a trip that he fucking invited me on. And the universe was like, now are we ready to go heal this? And I was like, oh, fuck. Okay, I guess. Yeah, sure. And it wasn't until I was able to really dig in and heal those abandonment wounds and start to switch that narrative within myself that I was going to be able to attract people who would never abandon me and show up in a different capacity because I was the person that was manifesting subconsciously, obviously, all of these people into my life so that my brain would be like, see, see, we're right. They abandon, they abandon, they abandon. And when you can take accountability for that and be like, okay, There's this shitty pattern of people that I'm attracting. What Mm -hmm. is this trying to tell me? What can I heal within myself in order to start attracting some better stuff? I love that so much. I love that we share that perspective because it's it it might make someone pissed, right? Like they might get really defensive. I think if you get defensive, that's even more of a hint. Look deeper, right? right? Something's in something inside of you is getting poked right now. Right. And that's a beautiful, beautiful sign of um, where you can improve and just like elevate and expand yourself. And it gives you the power back. You're like, okay, wait, I am responsible for all of this. So if I'm responsible for all of this chaos and all of this shit, I can be responsible for like beauty and grace and abundance Mm -hmm. and like unconditional love and whatever that is that you want to kind of create. So like own it, feel it, accept it, and then consciously 
try to like elevate yourself to create that reality that is in more in, in alignment with the future that you want. Yeah, absolutely. It's so important to use those things as kind of like an investigative tool. Like, okay, this shitty relationship happened. Instead of feeling like I wasted a year and a half of my life, like what was it trying to teach me and what can I take from this? I'm mm-hmm. a big believer in everything happens for a reason, but not like the toxic positivity, like it's fine, girl. Everything happens for a reason. Nothing's bad. But like even the deaths that I've had in my life, like the deep traumas that I've experienced, I can look back on those and be like, okay, this propelled me into becoming this type of person or I took these really important life lessons from this situation. Like I can look back and be like, yeah, everything that happened, the good, the bad, and the ugly, like I see the reasons behind that. It doesn't mean that it is happy or that you would choose that path or that the bad behavior that other people are bringing to you is deserved, but you can find the reasonings in that and it makes it feel a little less shitty when you can do that, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's just, it's a reality shift. It's like if you can look at something and find the gift in it, how much different is does everything look, feel, taste, ex- like everything is different versus, oh, that's shitty. Of course, this is my luck. You hear people, this is my right. luck all the time. Well, that is your luck. You're asking for it. You're literally speaking that into existence. You have to be so careful about your thoughts and your words that are because you'll you'll create that. When it comes to, I guess, like shifting from the person that was terrified of abandonment kind of unconsciously seeking out those relationships and then kind of manifesting the thing that you didn't want to happen and then becoming someone who now attracted your now husband and soon to be father of your baby. Mm -hmm. Uh, How did you relinquish that fear? Because I think so many of us, especially at a young age, we operate in this fear channel. Like a lot of our decisions are made out of fear and avoidance of pain and then it ends up showing up anyways. So how do you get to this place where you can, especially in your story where you have a real reason for these things, trust again and let go of that fear of abandonment and seek a relationship with fresh eyes and a fresh heart? Yeah, that's such a good question. And it's such a complicated answer. But when I came back from Europe, I released the book and everyone was like, oh my God, what the fuck happened after Europe? Um, And kind of, I say this lovingly, like berated me into (laughs) being like, we need a sequel. So I wrote the sequel a couple years later. It's called The Ridiculous Misadventures of a Single Girl. And it's a crazy whirlwind of like the two years after Europe, but that's where people will see me meet my now husband. And it was not an easy journey to getting to where we are now. Um, There was a lot of back and forth. He came into my life when I was very unhealed and still very much fucked up from all of the, the divorce and the love bombing and the heartbreak. Like I was still in love with my ex. Like it was like a mess. And I was able to recognize that wall going up which I've always been so good at keeping down, which was a new experience for me. And I was very conscious of the fact that I was running from something and that something felt like it was missing. What I ended up getting to was really being like, okay, first of all, what's missing is me. Like I kept looking for this completion from things that were outside of myself. So from men or success in my career or whatever it was, it was always looking for the completion outside of myself Mm -hmm. instead of going inward and finding that, you know, it sounds so cliche, but that self-love and knowing my worth and being content within myself before adding other things to my life. So that was part of it. The other part was that I had been so conditioned by my my marriage that was like extremely toxic once I was like out of it and able to like look with a different perspective in was like, oh my God, thank God I got out of that when I did. And then the relationship after that was so like love bomby and back and forth and like very intense and then like nothing. I had really like my my definition of love had become toxic. Mm. So when this like safe, healthy, wonderful And at times I say this in a good way because it's so good, boring, love came into my life. 
I was like, oh, this this can't be right. Like this is we'll say stable. Stable, yes. But like I mean, like, look, I I love that my husband and I can be bored together and lay there and watch Netflix and we're still so fucking happy together. Like we don't need any of the the drama and the spikes of, you know, the toxicity. Like, and mm-hmm. that's it, it took me a while to realize, like, oh, this is a good thing. <laughs> like I had been so conditioned to need those extreme highs and those extreme lows that this didn't it, it was like, oh well, there must be something more that I should be looking for than this. So that took me a while to kind of relearn that definition and feel at ease and comfortable in that like safe, non-abandoned love. Mm. Oh my gosh, there's so much that I want to get into. I swear you read my because I journal before I have a guest on, and oh, it just I love like that. helps. It helps me like free flow and just kind of. Not like I don't want to ever structure a conversation because they always take on a life of their own. And I love these moments where it's like I feel like you just read my journal because it's (laughs) so many of the things I wanted to get into. I guess starting with this idea of of wholeness and what's really interesting and it's something I learned recently. So did you know that the origin of the world, the word healed means whole? No, I didn't. But that makes sense and that's beautiful. So I have this spiritual teacher and he really is not a fan of the word healing as we use it today because he's like very particular with how he uses his words, like very intentional and goes back to the origin and like the fundamental meaning of it. So he's like, everyone is healed. Everyone is whole. Like you are not fractured as a person. Like you you are existing as a whole. Like you're alive. Right, you're, right. You, are, you are healed, which is a really big shift in the, in the way that you look at it because you do see people that kind of get t- – caught up in this like healing culture and they're constantly healing and they identify with healing and they identify with their wounds and then in that cycle they will never be whole and they'll never be okay because almost that attachment to whatever that transgression or trauma was is more important than actually coming out the other side right but what i was going to say was this idea of my better half i hate that. I hate mm-hmm. that. Are you half a person? Are you each right. half a person? And only when you're together, are you whole and okay? That's a recipe for a disaster. Like right. I'm whole, he's whole. And now together we are able to amplify. And our mission yes. is now like exponential. It's not cre- It's not seeking out love from a deficit. So that journey to wholeness, to healing, to looking inside versus outside What does that feel like? What does that feel like once you get to a place of self acceptance, self love, of like true heal, like healing, yeah, and being whole? Yeah. Oh, I love everything you just said because that's so true. And like also when even if you are saying like the the phrase my better half, like why is it the better of the two halves? But like yes, one hundred percent. For me, when I went on this Europe trip, it was like I knew I was looking for this. Like I have to learn how to love myself. Everybody kept being like, "You have to learn how to love yourself. Loving yourself is the most important thing. You can't love someone else until you love so- love yourself first. And I was like, "Okay, cool. I get it. I'm ready to do that. Can anyone tell me how?" And people mm-hmm. were like. Oh, well, no, it's just something you have to find. I was like, oh, okay. So it's like this mythical fucking thing that I'm just (laughs) supposed to go figure out. Cool. And, you know, I'm not the type of person that can look in the mirror and be like, I love you, Gabrielle. You're a fucking badass. Like if you can do that, more power to you. But it felt very inauthentic to me. So I was looking for this whole self-love question, answer, and I didn't find it on my trip. I found it when I came back, which is why it's written about in the epilogue of Eat, Pray, FML. And I came back from my trip. I got back to my mom's house because that's where you move when you're 28 and you get divorced. And it was like I stepped off the carousel. Like everything stopped moving. I was now not in Europe going around meeting all these people, having these experiences, like dealing with all these feelings. I was back at home getting divorced at my mother's house and it was like – Ooh, okay. And I fell into probably one of the biggest depressions that I've ever experienced. And in the process of trying to pull myself out of that, I discovered what it meant to love myself. So for me, I call it the self-love cocktail, obviously, because you have to equate it to something fun. And <laughs> I was so depressed that I was like, okay, 
I'm going to sit down and write a list of things that I can give myself every day that make me feel better. Like things that I don't need anybody else for. And for me, that list was like creating, dancing, meditating, going to the gym, eating healthy, like shit that I could do every single day that made me feel better. Either in the moment or, you know, obviously I'm not like loving going to the gym sweating, but I knew it was going to make me feel better in the long run. Um, So I would put that list on my mirror and I'd be like, okay, I'm going to do one of these things every single day and then I can get back in bed and like eat my snacks and watch my Netflix and be sad about my life. And I consistently started to do that. And then I would be like, okay, I'm going to do two things today and then I can get back in bed. And then it was three things and I didn't feel like I needed to get back in bed. And it kept going and building and building and I started feeling so much better and pulling myself out of this depression because I was unknowingly loving myself. And when you realize that loving yourself is as simple as giving your soul the things it loves and the things that's going to make you feel better, it was a complete perspective shift for me and it totally changed because now it was a checklist of things that I could actively do that I didn't need other people for. It wasn't this like weird, I need to look in the mirror and tell myself I love myself. It was like, no, if I want to show a significant other or a family member or a friend that I love them, I am going to do things that make them experience love. So when I'm looking to give myself love, why would I not use that same practice? Mm Mm-hmm. Those are great pieces of advice because people really are looking for something actionable and it does it does feel weird and inauthentic and almost like you're bullshitting when you do those affirmations. But and I I am with you, sister. I have been there and that has literally been my homework for the last six months with my spiritual teacher where he is that because I won't do it. I've done it like three times and he's like, what, like, what is your aversion to this? And I'm like, it just doesn't feel like it's doing anything. It doesn't feel real. It doesn't feel authentic. Like I feel like I'm a poser and he's like, and that's why you have to do it. Mm -hmm. And like every single time you do it, like you're kind of chipping away a little bit and it will become, it'll become where you don't have to say it where you can, and I think this is like the whole point, this is me kind of deducing it from my experience so far, which is where you do glance at yourself and there is just that radical acceptance. And you don't need to do the acts of love because while I do agree that we want to show that our affection, our love, and our caring, we do that through actions, through gifts, through time um, spent, all of these different modalities. I think once you get to the bigger picture of like, what is love? What is unconditional love? What is union? Like that can be felt without anything. That can be felt without communication. Like think about totally a friend who's like long distance and you haven't talked in six months. That love doesn't go anywhere and maybe you haven't acted a- upon it, but it still exists and you're certain of it. And I think that that is, I think that's the end point. I'm certainly not there all of the time. Totally. That's what that's what you're you're working towards and once right. you can get to that it's such a you feel such a peace within yourself but i think where people get tripped up too about the whole like quote healing journey like i went on that trip and was like i have to fucking come back healed like this has to be the trip mm-hmm. where i come back and i am fixed and it's like what the fuck does that even mean yeah. you know fixed for what capacity of your life like There are going to be so many different times where you feel like you've taken 10 steps back. There are Mm -hmm. going to be so many different experiences in your life where you're like, okay, now I have to heal again. And Mm -hmm. that can be exhausting. So it's like you have to reframe it to not be like, okay, I have to cross a finish line. You just want to start taking care of yourself better, whether that's through self-love or knowing your worth or setting boundaries. Like, Whatever that is for you in the particular healing growth spurt that you're going on, it can't be like this epic finish line where you're like, I just want to wake up and everything's going to be perfect and fine and feeling better because that's not reality. It's always going to be a process. Like healing is not linear in any sense of the word. Mm-hmm. No, it certainly isn't. I feel like very few things are in this right. existence. <laughs> When it co- we we touched a little bit on identifying with trauma, with mishaps, with wrongdoings, with healing, like we kind of take on these pseudo identities a lot of the time. And I think that one I see a lot is 
that of the tortured artist, right? Like they're so scared that if they come to a moment of peace and bliss that they'll all of a sudden they'll lose their edge or they won't be successful enough. And it kind of coincides with your example that you gave with And I see so many women, I don't know how many men this is true for, but so many women that are addicted to chaos, so much so that when they do find peace within a relationship, they find true love, like true steadiness, like this is dull, this is boring, because they're mistaking that chaos for love. They're mistaking that chaos for romance. That was Um, exactly what I went through with my current husband before I like figured my shit out. So how do you – how do you – distinguish between that? How do you prevent yourself from identifying that, especially in a position that you're in where you're public facing and you kind of, at least at this chapter of your life, you're reliving a lot of this stuff. So how do you get into a position where you're reliving it, but you're not going to succumb to that uh, tortured artist trap? Yeah, that's such a good question. I think, and I've, I've experienced a lot of this on, well, I won't say a lot, like on TikTok, you know, I get probably 90% is just positive support, love. And then there's the 10%, five of which are like just like troll men on the internet that like are living in their parents' basement. And the other five are like women that I'm clearly triggering something in them. But the one comment that I see a lot is like, God, can't you just move on and like forget about your ex-husband and stop talking about this story? And there's two sides to that coin. One, it's like, no, I'm on TikTok to like sell books and like it's a marketing strategy. So there's that. The other side of the coin is I can laugh and I can talk about this until the fucking cows come home because I'm healed from it. Right. Like it, there's no like reopening old wounds. There's no like – I could sit down with either of my exes and have a long lunch and be like, yo, dude, like crazy shit. What the fuck happened? Let's talk (laughs) about it. Like what was it like for you on your side? Because I'm that disconnected from it. They Both of them truly feel like characters in a story for me now. Um, Javier took a a longer time for me to get there than my ex-husband did. My ex-husband, it was pretty instantaneous. But – it, it really, I feel, is a testament to how much work I've put in and how much growth I've done. Um, as far as like leaning into the tortured artist, because like I know there's so many times where people are like, God, can Adele just get her heart broken again? Because like the record that comes after that is going to be <laughs> fucking amazing, uh, which is so fucked up and so sad. But like I also, I get it. But I think now it's just about owning where you're at in the moment. So like, yes, my first book, I wrote it in three months flat because I was like dealing with so much shit. I just needed to dump it out. Like it had to flow out of me. The second book took probably like eight to nine months for me to complete because I was in a very happy, stable relationship going back and kind of reopening a lot of stuff and getting that, you know, was a little more difficult. Um, and now people are like, when's the third book? When's the third book? And I'm like, guys, what What do you want me to write? Like, I'm happy we got married. We're having a baby. Everything's fucking phenomenal. Like, I got to live a little bit more life first before I can do that. But I think whenever you've gone through, like, the trauma or the incidences or the shit, when you can honor it in a way that you know it's part of your story, but you don't have to go back into the hysteria of it, you know? And Mm -hmm. look, for some people, that's going to take more time and more healing. And for those people that always make those comments of like, why can't you just let it go? Why do you keep talking about it on, you know, online? I think that's bringing up something in them that's being triggered. Like why why are they being triggered that I can't talk about an experience from a very disconnected standpoint, whether it's for marketing or for other people to heal or whatever it's for? Like what is that triggering within you? Mm-hmm. What is the role of forgiveness in all, in all of this and in healing and in heartbreak and in trauma? This is such a hot topic for people. I did an episode – on my podcast like way back in season one on forgiveness and people either go back and listen to it religiously 
or they're like, fuck you, Gabrielle. <laughs> like, I don't have to forgive anybody. And you don't. You don't have to forgive ever- anyone that you don't want to. However, it is my belief that not forgiving someone only hurts you. Um, and it goes back to what we were talking about earlier that when you're walking around in a certain type of energy, you're going to attract that energy into your life. You don't forgive people for them. Doesn't matter if they deserve it. Doesn't matter like how long it's been. Like you forgive people because you want to elevate yourself and you mm-hmm. want to to be vibrating on a higher level to attract and manifest the good shit you deserve into your life. And if you're walking around hating someone and cursing someone, you're not doing that. So Mm -hmm. for me, it was never a question of like forgiving the people who have wronged me. Like, you know, and there's different levels of that. Like I had to do work forgiving my dad because like obviously he didn't mean to die, but like he still left me. Like Mm -hmm. the the six-year-old little girl in me was like, no, yeah, like that there's like a big wound there. Had to forgive my ex-husband for, you know, the stuff he did within our marriage, the the actions he took after the book became successful um to try and hurt me, like all of that I've had to just completely let go of. And did he necessarily deserve that? No, he quite frankly is a piece of shit human. But me walking around like feeling that hate and being like, screw him, like he's an asshole. It's not affecting him at all. It's only bringing my vibration down. And like, I care about myself way too much to allow hate to make me come down on a vibrational level. Yeah. There's that quote. It's an American, famous American author and his name is escaping me right now. I've not been sleeping the last few days. So my memory is not as sharp and I like can't pull my library cards as much as um, easily as I typically can. But it's that anger is an acid that does more damage to the vessel than it does what it's poured upon. Mm. And I truly believe that. I think it's the same with with jealousy because I think jealousy and anger are very closely tied. Mm -hmm. So the idea that someone you're like, I'm not going to forgive them. You have no idea what they did. I was like, I have literally witnessed some people that have gone through the worst travesties and they have forgiven that person. Like uh, like yeah. one of my really good friends, her name's Candace Mama and she's um, about to do her second appearance on my podcast and I just adore this woman so much. She was living in an apartheid state in Africa and this man had murdered her father, like murdered yeah. him very violently. And after the arraignment and after the trial, like she hugged him and she was like, I forgive mm. you. Like I love, and she mm. got to love, like, you know what I mean? Like true embrace yeah. with this man. And yeah. there's not much worse that we right. can do to another human, right? Than taking yeah. their life. Like that's pretty fucking intense. And she, I'm sure it wasn't easy for her. And she's talked publicly about this a lot, but it's always possible and you're holding on to that. Like you will get start getting sick. You can start gaining weight. You'll start noticing that like your life starts getting very dark. And you, like yeah. you said, you deserve so much more than that. So it's not about the other person at all. Although it can be like if you want to get – if you want to really see how far you can push this thing, like can I get to love with the person that has done the right. worst thing to me? I'm like what a beautiful gift. What a beautiful superpower that you can have. So yeah, I see this movement for like un forgiveness, right? And it's like I'm the strong woman. I'm gonna, I'm going to have my boundary. That's not a boundary. Like that's a delusion. Mhm. Yeah, mm-hmm. and there's there's a way to have boundaries and forgiveness at the same time. Absolutely. Like, look, you don't have to reach out to the person and no. be like, "Hey, I'd love to take you out for tea." Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like right. it doesn't it doesn't have to go that far. Mm-hmm. Um as long as you are not walking around with hate in your heart and shit clogging down your energy. That's all that we're aiming for. God bless that woman for being able to do that. That's huge. But you're absolutely right. Like if you look at the word disease, it's dis-ease. So when you have dis-ease within yourself, within your heart, within your spirit, you will eventually create disease within yourself. Mm -hmm. You are going to get sick. You are going to like – it's not going to be a good situation for you whether that happens soon or 20 years down the road. Like don't allow it to tank your energy because someone wronged you. And 
I did this one episode on the podcast that really like allowed me to tap into like having things make sense a little more. And it was with this spiritual guide who basically like talks about soul contracts a lot. Mm -hmm. And the way she described it was like, okay, so everybody's up there, like where whatever you believe, like heaven, the universe, whatever. We're all up there before we come down to this, like this life, this body. And we have this kind of set path of the the things we're going to learn, what we're going to do, the stories that we're going to write, the lessons we're going to, you know, um, and the people that are up there are like, okay, I need this person to be this, this villain in my story. And the people up there are like, okay, I'll do that for you in this life. And it's usually the people that love you the most that are mm-hmm. going to be willing to take that role on because it's such a shitty, heavy role and they want to like help you learn that lesson. And you're like, okay, great. And you're like, ooh, and I have to learn this lesson this time around. And someone's like, I'll do that for you. And you all get on a bus and you come down here and forget that the plan was ever made. And then all of this stuff starts happening. And if you can look at the people in your life, like that I had a soul contract with my dad, that he had to leave at that age because it was going to set me on this path to learning this huge life lesson of abandonment that I needed to learn because of whatever happened in a previous life. Sorry, I know we're getting a little woo-woo, guys, but... My audience is used to it. You're in good company. great. Love it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And, you know, and that like my ex-husband, like that he was the person that came in to like really set me off on on this like different path and that Javier came in to be like blow up my world and send me to Europe by myself. I would have never ended up on that trip without those two things happening in that domino effect. So when you can look at the people that have hurt you and be like, yeah, it sucks and it was horrible and like there was trauma because of it or like whatever the fallout is, but it it happened because I needed to learn the lessons and thank God that those people chose to come forward and help me learn that and be that teacher for me. It kind of gives you a little bit more peace in the fucked up shit that happens in our life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think a really good gauge as to if you've gotten to that place of forgiveness and if you've truly like transcended that experience is kind of it's that visceral effect right like your gut will tell you like you'll the topic Mm. or the person will come up and you'll be like you won't be queasy anymore your heart won't get collapsed onto itself you'll be like oh this is fine but if you still have your body giving you that signature then I feel like you have to keep revisiting it to do the full release and I think where that gets super important I mean it's important for everyone because like we talked it, it can create illness and disease and it has a whole bunch of negative consequences. But I think especially for women, if you're planning on having kids or if you're currently pregnant, it's like all of that gets – like the baby is so tuned in. You are one. You know, that whole nine, ten months, you are one being. You are shared. Like so Native Americans um, have this word. Like they don't even – I feel like they don't call – there's a specific word for the mother and baby because neither of them have their own word for like the first three months even after right. the baby comes out because they believe that they're tethered together. It's just mm-hmm. one unified soul. So do it for your kids. Do it for your kids' kids because now what we're learning with epigenetics and how that can pass down like even seven generations, it's like that pain will be felt until someone's willing to feel it it'll, or it'll continue yeah. until someone's willing to to heal it. So yeah, yeah I think you got to forgive. I- I think there's so much stuff that's coming out now in the spiritual realm around generational trauma and how that affects like my mom, for example, she's a clairvoyant channel. So she does a lot of work with energy and clearing subconscious beliefs. And there'll be times where we'll sit down and she'll be like, okay, this is something you picked up in the womb. And Mm -hmm. it's like, what the fuck, dude? Like to think about the fact that in so young before we even have memories of any kind that like this is where we picked up this subconscious belief that has been running our life for God knows how long and this is something we need to fix. And you want to take responsibility for those things so that they, the cycles are broken so that we're not passing them down. Like there's things, you know, my mother is, as far as parents go, like pretty fucking saint worthy. I mean, I know we all fuck our kids up at some point, but like for all you know, intents and purposes, like she's up there with the best of them. And even I can sit there and be like, oh, 
this thing that I watched her struggle with or go through, I adopted that at some point and I need to break that and let that go. So there's always like patterns that you can look back and be like, okay, what do I need to look at doing some forgiveness work around, even if it wasn't your trauma that incurred, even if it was something that happened before, you know, you were here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, there are studies everywhere. Like one really interesting one that, I mean, again, like we're talking about it woo, but to bring it back more to science that's maybe easier for some people to understand is moms that were pregnant during 9-11 and I think Mm. specifically up in like the upstate and like the in towards the city region, their babies that were about to get delivered all of a sudden were breached, like they flipped themselves. So they went head up because they were like, it's not safe to come out yet. Wow. Like the, they are so in tuned. They've had studies with mice and they they kind of associated the smell of cherry blossoms to like a physical pain and they would pair it together, pair it together, pair it together, eventually get rid of the, the pain stimulus and just show the cherry blossom scent. And then that would trigger um, like a response within the mouse. They had the mice have litters and then the pups had a response to the fragrance fragrance so it's like this stuff gets passed on like it's kind of indisputable like there's just so much overwhelming evidence so it's it's it sounds crazy but so much of our internal environment is passed on yeah absolutely like it's kind of irrefutable when you look at like all the studies that have been done and I think it it works on a, a spiritual side and a scientific side. Like it, it, it all makes sense in the bigger picture of what we end up dealing with throughout our lives as humans. Uh, one of the things I was really curious about. So you had mentioned on previous podcasts that you had this relationship with your body, and you had like eating disorders in the past, and this kind of ties back into self love and getting this reframe of self acceptance and uh, just like a different perspective. How has that been with pregnancy? Because that is such a struggle for a lot of women who haven't gotten pregnant yet. And it is Mm -hmm. one of the aversions. They're like, I don't want to get pregnant because I don't want to lose my body. And to me, on the other side of having two kids, it's just asinine that you're giving yourself that kind of perspective. Um, But I'm curious, how has pregnancy shifted that relationship with your body? Yeah. um, So I struggled with bulimia throughout high school on and off. Um, and then in my early twenties and not to a point, which is going to sound so bad saying this, but not to a point where it would have been categorized as like detrimental. Although like anything you're doing to your body in that form, like is obviously affecting you in a negative way, but like on the scale if like a therapist was looking at it, like what is considered really bad. Um, I was not on that end of it. But it was very clear to me that it was a problem and it was really centered around control. It would flare up whenever I felt out of control. And I had worked really hard to get to a more consistent place like in my later 20s and early 30s to where it was non-existent anymore. But I don't feel like just because you're not physically doing an act doesn't mean that there's not still effects of it that live in your body or in your brain. Um, I also grew up in Los Angeles in the film industry where like everyone has to be a certain size. And like, if you're not, there's 12 other blondes that will come in and take your spot. So (laughs) it was always kind of like, there was always a focus on physical appearance and weight for me growing up. Um, not from like my family or anything, but just in my environment and like the industries that I was around and a part of. And I have to say when I knew I was getting pregnant, I had a lot of fear around how my body was going to change and how that was going to make me feel. Mm -hmm. It surprised me that when my body did start to change, I didn't go into like the spiral of like, oh my God, you know, feeling not okay in my own skin because I thought I was going to. Like I was like bracing for impact that this was going to be like a fucking shit show. That being said, (laughs) I'm two months away from giving birth. I don't know how I will feel after the baby is out. That will probably be a different conversation of like that journey to getting back to feeling like myself. But it wasn't until the past like honestly five days where – because I was fine with the belly happening. I felt like my my hips were getting wider. Like 
but I still felt kind of cute. Like I was like, all right, I can get into the whole like I'm pregnant. Like it's a belly. It's cute. The past five days or so, my face has started to see the effects of it. (laughs) And for me, that's what's been the most triggering because even like when I was dealing with like how my weight would fluctuate in my younger years, like when I would get to a not good place, it's when I could see it in my face. So Mm -hmm. now when I'm like looking at myself, like doing interviews or in the mirror, like it's a little triggering and I'm like trying to recognize it and be like, okay, it's just a moment in time. Like even if it's for the next two months, that's a blip on the radar, you know, like really like talking myself through it. But being compassionate with yourself, you know, especially if you come from an eating disorder past, like when there's going to be triggers that come up, like not trying to be like, oh, it's fine. Not a big deal. It is a big deal. Like you're, you're being plugged into things that used to make you really uncomfortable, uncomfortable enough to hurt yourself and hurt your body. So I think for me, it's been a constant just practice of self-love and being Mm -hmm. like, you know, thank God that my body is able to do this. Like Mm -hmm. what a magical thing that it's experiencing and still giving myself the credits, not the right word, still allowing myself the space to be like, and I'm super fucking uncomfortable with what I'm seeing in the mirror at sometimes. And that's okay. You know, like being Mm -hmm. compassionate with myself in that sense and not trying to stuff those feelings down, but like letting them come out being like, okay, here's your space for them. And now we're going to let it go and go grow a baby. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. For me, it's it's kind of this honesty check as to where you are with, with your self-love, with your self-acceptance. Like, do you truly love yourself? Do you truly accept yourself? Or is it based on a whole bunch of conditions? Because mm-hmm. we love to apply conditions to everything. And I only love myself as long as I weigh this. I only love myself as long as I don't have stretch marks. I only love myself right. if I'm going to bounce back and be able to post on Instagram, right? We put those conditions on ourselves, And it's like, that's not love because is that how much you're going to love your baby? Is only only right. if they have these certain boxes checked off or do you love them wholly, flaws and all? And like I say flaws with air quotes, like do you love them wholly um, right. or is it or is it conditional? And you have to ha- be able to be honest, I guess, because for me it was this it's the same way. Like I've had two now and I feel like the first one was a lot easier because I was told I couldn't have kids. So the fact that I got pregnant, I was elated. I was like, holy shit. I knew like I made this happen and what a blessing. And like there is nothing better than what I'm experiencing. Like although feet swelling, whatever. So fucking excited. You're like, there's I'll a baby take it. in my it's belly. Great. <laughs> yeah. The aches, I'm like, thank God that, you know, big yeah. belly, big happy baby. <laughs> and so like just utter acceptance and love for all, the entire experience. And then the second one, I think maybe I was like, oh, well, I, you know, now I can have babies. So a little bit of that appreciation wasn't at the same level as the first. So when I didn't lose the weight as fast or I got extra stretch marks, I was a lot harder on myself. And I had a lot more of that self-deprecating inner dialogue. And it's like, okay, well, is this the, is this really my ceiling of self-love is so, is so long as like my butt needs to come back up and like all right. of these things. I'm like, that's not self-love. That's all, all conditional. So it's a work in progress and it's just radical honesty with yourself. And you're like, okay, this is an opportunity to grow and to really like lean into that discomfort and say, if I look in the mirror and I'm totally a different person, like I'm at, there's this exercise I want to say it's Michael Singer, the guy that wrote The Untethered Soul, mm-hmm. or it's David Singer. I always mess it's up a great his name. Book. Yeah, it's, yeah, his it's in his sequel to that. Um, I think it's Living Untethered. But okay. he's like, you you go into the mirror and imagine that like you're the opposite sex, right? So mm. like you are so fundamentally different on the outside. Are you still you? And that mm. is such a mind fuck because we identify so much with right. our body, and I think. What a powerful tool because our bodies are going to break down. Like they degrade slowly over time. And especially if you're a beautiful woman, I think that could be really hard, right? Aging can be really hard. And like seeing the wrinkles and the, you know, the texture and all of these things. And if you can get to this place with, I am not my body, right? Like my soul is not my body. This is simply a vessel to be able to experience this world, then 
how much easier that is to get to self-love. So as like a, you know, you start sagging and whatever, it's, um, it's not going to affect your day. It's not going to affect your ability to love yourself or love someone else. Yeah. 100%. That's, that's an incredible thing to think about the, the gender reversal. Um, Whoa, right. It's also so much easier said than done. So people that are listening to this, I'm sure they're like, okay, yeah, great. Until you see the gray hairs and the texture and the wrinkles, like it's, it's a lot easier said than done. I also think, you know, and this brings us back to what we were touching on earlier is like making sure you're keeping track of your thoughts and the words that you're speaking out. Like Mm -hmm. they're so powerful. Like the thoughts that you think about yourself, if you're walking around being like, I'm so tired, I'm so tired, I'm so tired. Of course you're so fucking tired. You keep saying how (laughs) tired you are. And it's almost – and this is going to come off interesting, but it's almost like you need to gaslight yourself at first. Like just when you start thinking those negative thoughts about yourself, be like, "Mm, no, we're not going to do that. Actually, I'm fucking so full of energy and I feel so great and I'm like loving life right now. Like when you're looking in the mirror and you're like, oh, my face looks fat. It's like, no, I look freaking beautiful and I am a rock star. Like whether or not you're consciously believing it, your brain can't tell the difference. So switch the thought and say the positive version of that thought and watch how your perspective starts to change over the days and the weeks. Like it's pretty crazy how quickly you can switch things around when you're just keeping track of your thoughts. And what's really interesting too is they've done studies where if you smile, like let's say you're in the worst mood ever and you smile, it actually changes your neurochemistry yep. in that moment. So all of a sudden you're telling your brain, oh, we're going to make happy hormones right now. We're not sad. We're not angry. We're not depressed. Like we're going to start making happy hormones. So like even just changing your facial expression can have a huge impact. And Absolutely. I feel like a lot of times too, we get in this cycle. It's like we Wherever we are, if we're tired, if we're exhausted, if we're no energy, we're not feeling motivated, you're like kind of reinforcing that every single day just like from a chemical standpoint. So how can you go in there and interject and and kind of like take the off ramp to that? So for me, when I was going through my postpartum journey, I was pretty much like I was pretty depressed and pretty low energy and like low like I just I didn't want to do anything, just like no want or desire for anything. And I got to a point where I'm like, this is not working. I don't want to feel like this. It's not working for me. It's not working for my family. And I kind of beat myself up internally and made myself just work out. I'm like, get out of bed. You're I have one of those exercise mirrors, like those that you yeah. work out, has all of your stuff. And I was like, it's right in the other room. Stop with the pity party stop with like all of these excuses and just fucking do it like just Mm -hmm. fucking do it and I did and then the moment I started moving my body was like oh this is what we're doing this is what we're feeling and I started to come back to life so it's whatever your road is to improvement like whether it's in like a very soft gentling nurturing way that's probably best or if you take the path that I did and you're like this is just enough I've had enough and I need to do something else and you kind of like strong arm yourself to do something it's like you just have to get out of the pattern as hard as that is like break that that pattern and then everything else will start to shift yeah self-love cocktail like what are the things that are going to make you feel better start fucking doing them one day at a time like Mm -hmm. whatever it takes that's going to be the driving force to get you out of whatever you're feeling in right now. Amen. So before we take off, this was incredible. Thank you so very much. Can you please tell the listeners where they can follow you, how they can support you, and anything that you might be working on besides this beautiful baby right now? Yes. Thank you so much for having me. This was such a lovely conversation and I'm such a fan of yours. So this was this was great. Um, I am on Instagram at Gabrielle Stone, on TikTok at Gabrielle underscore Stone. The books are available exclusively on Amazon. The first one is Eat, Pray, FML. The sequel is The Ridiculous Misadventures of a Single Girl. You can also get both of them signed by me on my website, which is eatprayfml.com. I also have a self-love healing journal called Fuck Off, I'm Healing, which is kind of a step-by-step guide of me walking you through undoing the uh, trauma and bullshit that life throws at you in a very real and authentic way. Um, And our podcast, which we have had Candace on, is um, FML Talk, and it airs every Wednesday. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, and go get some rest. Thank you, love. Appreciate it. And that's it for this week's episode of Chatting with Candace. Before you go, if you want to share the content with a friend or two that you think that would like it and leave that five-star review, I would greatly appreciate it. And I'll see you next week. Thanks. Bye, everybody.